Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For our guests here in-house, we would ask that courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off as we prepare to begin. And for those watching online, we remind you you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Leading our discussion this afternoon is Peter Brooks, Dr. Brooks' Senior Fellow for National Security Affairs in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy. He is also in his fifth term as a member of the Congressional U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Prior to coming to Heritage, he served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Affairs in the George W. Bush administration. He has also served on the Committee Staff for International Relations in the House with the Central Intelligence Agency, the State Department, and was an active duty naval officer. Please join me in welcoming Peter Brooks. Peter. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to Heritage and our program on Iran. Since 2015, the nuclear agreement with Iran, Tehran has continued its troubling policies in the Middle East, particularly in Syria, uh, Iraq, and Yemen. Iran's expanding influence in these war-torn countries has been facilitated by the strategic dividends and sanctions relief provided by the nuclear deal. This raises questions like, how should the United States respond? What should be done about the flawed nuclear agreement? How can the United States target the Iranian regime's repression at home? Joining us today to discuss these and other issues are Jim Phillips. Jim is a Senior Research Fellow for Middle Eastern Affairs in the Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy uh, Studies here at the Heritage Foundation. He's a veteran foreign policy specialist who has written and spoken widely on Middle Eastern issues and international terrorism since coming to Heritage in 1979. He's authored dozens of papers on Iran, its nuclear program, and its use of terrorism and has testified before Congress on Iran's nuclear program and other Middle Eastern security issues. Jim Hansen, next to him, is the president of the Security Studies Group. He served in the U.S. Army Special Forces and conducted counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, as well as diplomatic intelligence and humanitarian operations in more than a dozen countries. He is the author of Cut Down the Black Flag, A Plan to Defeat the Islamic State. And Mark Dubowitz. Mark is the CEO of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, where he leads projects on Iran, sanctions, countering threat finance, and nonproliferation. He is widely recognized as one of the key influencers in shaping economic sanctions policies to counter the threats from Iran and its surrogates. Mark was featured as one of the key, quote unquote, financial warriors against Iran by the Wall Street Journal's Jay Solomon in his book, The Iran Wars. Mark has advised the Trump, Obama, and George W. Bush administrations and lawmakers on both sides of the aisle on Iran issues and has testified more than 20 times before Congress and foreign legislatures. With that, Jim, can you start us off? Sure. Thanks, Peter. I'd like to focus my remarks on Iran's various regional threats and the degree to which those threats have been boosted and complicated by the Iran nuclear agreement. I'm sorry to say that the axis of evil is alive and well. And if you like what North Korea is doing today, you're going to love what Iran is going to be doing a few years down the road. Both of these states are led by rogue regimes that have sought nuclear weapons and the missiles to deliver them. They've cooperated closely on ballistic missile developments and perhaps to a lesser extent on nuclear issues. Both regimes have re uh, repeatedly violated their nonproliferation commitments. Uh, and just as the 1994 agreed framework uh, with North Korea uh, failed to stop that country's nuclear ambitions, I think uh, future historians will uh, eventually uh, say that the 2015 Iran nuclear agreement also failed to stop Iran's nuclear ambitions. And I would argue that Iran is a much more dangerous uh, regime and poses greater long-term threats than North Korea. It has a much stronger economy, a much more potent ideology, uh, many more uh, friends, allies, and surrogates uh, around the world and in the region. Uh, and it has a much more aggressive record of regional interventions. 
and Iran's neighborhood, uh, the Persian Gulf, is the center of gravity of world oil production. So if Iran is able to establish dominance over the flow of that oil, there will be uh, tremendous uh, energy security, national security, and perhaps uh, long-term economic uh, re repercussions cascading out of that. Uh, contrary to the promises of the Obama administration, the nuclear deal did not moderate Iran's behavior. In fact, Tehran has stepped up its malign activities in the region since 2015, uh, and the nuclear agreement has made a bad situation worse by boosting Iran's dictatorship in the economic, the, the military, and the geopolitical spheres. The nuclear agreement handed Iran an economic bonanza, uh, up to $100 billion. No one really knows how much in sanctions relief and unfrozen assets. And this economic transfusion has uh, boosted Iran's economy, uh, enhanced its ability to threaten its neighbors with conventional weapons, terrorism, and subversion, and increase its support for its uh, far-flung uh, surrogate network. Uh, for example, Iran increased its def defense budget uh, recently, announcing that there would be $300 million more uh, in funding for the ballistic missile program and the Quds Force. And that's very concerning because those are two of the most uh, worrisome aspects of the Iran's threats. Uh, the Quds Force is the elite uh, special forces of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, which uh, are charged with protecting and advancing Iran's revolution, not Iran's national interests, and that's an important uh, uh, difference. Uh, since the July 2015 nuclear agreement, Iran has escalated its military intervention in Syria in close cooperation with Russia. Iran's troops uh, and surrogate militias have played the leading role in uh, assisting the Assad regime's attempts to claw back territory from Syrian rebels. Iran has deployed more than 5,000 revolutionary guards, uh, troops and advisors, uh, as well as technical support, uh, and in addition, 20,000 foreign fighters from Iran-backed militias, Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, Iraqi Shiite militias, and recruits uh, from Afghanistan and Pakistan. This aggressive intervention which has been partially eclipsed by the Russian uh, air campaign, has decisively shifted the balance of power inside Syria in favor of the Assad regime. And now that the Islamic State is on the verge of defeat, the US mu may, must take steps uh, to preclude Iran from filling the vacuum left by the Islamic State and, and pre prevent it from uh, repositioning Hezbollah in the Golan Heights uh, and elsewhere for the next round of warfare with, with Israel. Iran also has stepped up its hostile activities uh, targeting the Jewish state. It's provided thousands of increasingly uh, capable and long-range rockets to Hamas and Palestine Islamic Jihad in Gaza, in addition to an estimated 150,000 rockets and missiles uh, to Hezbollah. Uh, in case the Israeli government had any doubt about the nature of uh, Iran's hostility, the Revolutionary Guards helpfully provided uh, uh, a sign on one of the missiles they tested in March 2016, which said in Hebrew, uh, not in Farsi, but in Hebrew, uh, Israel uh, must be wiped off the earth. Iran also has escalated its threats to Arab adversaries uh, since the nuclear agreement was signed. It stepped up long-standing efforts to radicalize Shiites in Bahrain. It has backed militant groups such as Hezbollah and the Dawa party there, and uh, trained militants from Bahrain in Revolutionary Guard camps in Iran. Bahrain has intercepted several arms shipments from Iran, and by the way, that's, that's in violation of the UN Security Council Resolution 2231, which enshrined the nuclear agreement and that prohibits, uh, prohibits these arms uh, exports. Iranian hardliners have also escalated their pressure against Bahrain, claiming that it is a, a long-lost province of Iran that should be annexed to the Islamic Republic. 
Saudi Arabia also has come under increasing pressure from Iran, not only from the Saudi branch of Hezbollah, which has launched terrorist attacks inside the kingdom, but also from uh, Houthi rebels in Yemen that have launched, uh, a, that are fighting the Saudi-led intervention in that country in support of Yemen's internationally recognized government. The Houthis have also launched uh, SCUD and other missiles against uh, Saudi territory and raided villages on the, si the Saudi side of the border. Um, uh, lifting UN sanctions on Iran also helped uh, ease Iran's diplomatic isolation and paved the way for enhanced strategic cooperation with Russia. It, it allowed uh, uh, Russia to, uh, or it allows Iran the opportunity to purchase more advanced arms from Russia to modernize uh, its military. Uh, and Russia already has delivered S-300 missiles uh, that could greatly complicate uh, Israeli or American retaliatory, preventive, or preemptive uh, strikes against Iran's nu nuclear uh, uh, facilities if uh, the deal is violated. Uh, and I'm not a proponent of the deal. Uh, I'm not really focusing on the deal here. If it was up to me, I think we'd uh, uh, find uh, Iran in violation of that deal. It definitely has violated the Security Council resolution that accompanied the deal. But regardless of what the policy is on the nuclear issue, the U.S. has to push back stronger against Iran on, on, at the regional level. Uh, the, I think first and foremost, we must draw clear red lines and enforce them. Uh, number one is the uh, nuclear red line, and, and I would argue that it's a deterrence that uh, is the, the chief barrier to uh, Iran's proceeding down the nuclear path, not some kind of uh, diplomatic agreement, uh, and that the U.S. needs to maintain its uh, strong forces in the Gulf and an ability to, uh, to launch a credible uh, use of force against uh, the nuclear facilities or other aspects of Iranian power if called upon. The U.S. should also f uh, strengthen its allies, especially Israel and the Gulf Cooperation Council states that face uh, the most immediate threats from Iran, should build up GCC defense capabilities, particularly in the areas of missile defense, anti-submarine forces, naval forces, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, assets. And the Pentagon should expand and institutionalize jo joint planning and joint exercises to develop a shared strategy for deterring and containing uh, the Iranian regime. Uh, missile defense should be a high priority. The, Israel has a very good one. The U.S. can do more to help uh, Israeli withstand the uh, b ballistic missile threats, but the GCC states uh, also face that threat, and they have much less capabilities. They all have, uh, except for Oman, uh, U.S. Provide, sold uh, Patriot missiles, but those missiles are not integrated into a regional uh, d defense system, and that needs to be done to uh, Im improve the effectiveness uh, against Ira the Iranian ballistic missile threat. Uh, another priority should be imposing additional sanctions on Iran for terrorism, for its ballistic missile activities and human rights abuses. Uh, especially targeting the Revolutionary Guards and the, the huge constellation of enterprises that uh, s the Revolutionary Guards have spun off to support its operations. And uh, the goal of these sanctions should be to force Tehran to pay an increasing price for the, the hostile activities of the Revolutionary Guard. Finally, the U.S. should uh, seek to weaken and undermine uh, Iran's allies and surrogates, particularly Hezbollah, which has been instrumental in Iran's campaign in Syria, as well as uh, Iraq. Uh, it's, Hezbollah has been training Houthi rebels in Yemen. Uh, it's also very uh, active in Lebanon. Uh, last year, the GCC and the Arab League declared Hezbollah to, uh, to be a terrorist state and designated it as such, but the EU continues to differentiate between the Hezbollah military wing and the political wing as if the political wing has no knowledge or power to stop the terror activities of, of the so-called military wing. 
So Washington should work with the GCC and Israel to uh, try to influence the EU to step up its sanctions on Hezbollah uh, and join the rest of the world or much of the rest of the world in, in uh, trying to reduce uh, the threats that that organization poses. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, the nuclear deal has not moderated Iran. In fact, it has strengthened and, and emboldened hardliners within Iran, and Washington uh, must impose uh, clear and increasing costs on Ir the, the regime in order to uh, dissuade it from continuing on its present path. And let me just stop there. Thank you, Jim. Jim Hansen? <clears throat> I don't know if you guys caught this from Jim's remarks, but Iran's the bad guys, okay? Can we just lay that on the table? And the funny thing is, that actually needs to be said. You know, we spent the past eight years watching President Obama empower this regime. And for some reason, and I, I still am stunned, I don't know where he read this, heard it, thought it, I don't know who gave him the idea that Iran could be a partner for peace, but he treated them that way. He gave them everything they wanted, everything they asked for, and from the, even before he took power, he was making moves to make them the regional hegemon. And like I said, I, I can find no historical background for this. It's not like they haven't been doing bad things, I don't know, since 1979. That ring a bell for anybody? That was a pretty bad time for U.S.-Iranian relations. They've been killing Americans since then. Through the entire Iraq war, they were one of the major producers and distributors of explosively formed projectiles that killed American troops. Somewhere between 500 and 1,000 at least American troops were directly killed by weaponry provided by the Iranians to the Shia militias that were used by them and by Al Qaeda in Iraq to kill US troops. And yet somehow, he decided that they were going to be the ones that we should back. That was the horse we should back. So now we're dealing with that. We're dealing with the fact that not only have they been empowered, they've been returned to the international community, their banking privileges, their cash. You know, I mean, 2016, they were the State Department's leading sponsor of terrorism worldwide. Now, that may not get you much in the Trump administration. In the Obama administration, it got you pallets full of cash flown in the middle of the night. They're spending that money now on a lot of the organizations that Jim mentioned. You know, I want to talk a little bit about some of their proxies. The main ones, Hezbollah, obviously, is a humanitarian group that operates in Lebanon to feed the poor, as we're all well aware. Yeah. Or Hezbollah is a terrorist organization that occasionally shares some of its ill-gotten gains with people to buy their allegiance. All right? They are a bad actor. They're, they're one of the main places that Iran spends its money. They're one of the main ways Iran pushes its power and destabilizes the region. Hamas, there's another wonderful group of humanitarians. Iran backs them, you know, and they're causing no end of, of death and destruction. And, you know, the other thing I'd like to note, let's, let's flip another thing on its head. Israel's a great ally. Holy cow, can we get back to that again? You know, we can go from having Iran as an ally and Israel as a frenemy at best under the Obama administration to Israel being our only true friend in the region and Iran being the enemy to peace in that region. I think just if we've changed nothing else but that thought process, I think we have established a much better and much more realistic world order. So some of the other groups, obviously, you know, they're backing, uh, Iran is backing the Houthis in Yemen, and there's a bit of a kind of a dangerous situation there because you've got the Gulf Arab states, UAE and, and the others, helping, and it's not like they're really helping good guys there. You know, they're helping less bad guys in some cases against them, but we've got a kind of a Shia, Sunni little scrap going on there, which is dangerous. Uh, that's something we need to keep an eye on. But the two places where I think Iranian influence right now is the most important to the United States is Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan. All right, we've got wars going on in both of those. Uh, we have a plan we're about, I, I think the nice thing is we're actually at the end game in Iraq. Um, what's going on in Syria? I don't know, anybody know? I'm pretty sure nobody, nobody knows what the answer is there. It's not good. 
It's not ended. It's closer to the end. But we need to be planning for a post-ISIS phase in both those countries. And one of the things that has to happen is we have to stop the advance of Iran into both those areas, and we have to push them back. Uh, one of the main dangers and one of Iran's biggest goals has been to create what some call a Shiite crescent or a land bridge to the Mediterranean. All right, if you go through Iraq and Syria, you get to the Med. And that would be Iran's greatest, one of their greatest dreams, along with nukes and other bad things. But that's what they want. They want to control that swath of territory. They'd like to control all of it. But if they can at least have the ability to move from Iran to the Mediterranean or the other way, they've accomplished something that we can't tolerate. Nobody can. You know, that's, that's just a, a bad scenario for everyone. They've been very, very good at seeding that area with militias. You know, we always hear about the Shia militias that have been involved first in, in the Iraq war in killing Americans and as a destabilizing force there. But once we left and Iran moved into that vacuum, they started creating alliances with local Shia militias in what could become a Shiite crescent. That's a, that's a horribly bad thing for everybody. All right, but they've been smart about it. These are local Shia in majority Sunni areas. And what they've done is kind of a reverse Sons of Iraq concept, all right, where during the surge, we went in and we worked with the tribal leaders and we made friends with them. And we said, this is your territory. We'll help you. Al Qaeda is in Iraq is an enemy to all of us and we want stability. So we basically made them the local constabulary and said, we'll back you as you try to take control of your own areas from Al Qaeda in Iraq. Well, what Iran has done is in these areas where there were pockets of Shia villages and, and people, they started paying them. And they said, we're protecting you against, uh, against ISIS. We're protecting you against the, you know, the other imperialists, the coalition. We're going to be your friend. And so they built alliances with these people and allegiance from these people that goes to Tehran, not even to Baghdad. And that's, uh, that's something we now have to deal with because they're there, they're armed, they feel empowered. And unless you know, we and the other folks in the region can do something to push them back, they're going to be at least the foundation of that land bridge to the Mediterranean. And that can't happen. So I've got an idea. <laughs> Let's do something about it, all right? Let's not just admire the problem and say this is awful and horrible. There are ways we can deal with this. The areas they're in are majority Sunni areas. So they're the same places that ISIS has decimated. They're essentially part of the regions that now have to come back under control. Now, Iraq and Syria are both broken states, all right? The Baghdad government exists. They're fine. They're doing things. But the idea that they alone can go into the Sunni areas and provide governance in a way that will be accepted by the people there is a fantasy. It's not gonna happen, they don't trust them. All right, they already got burned once. We promised them after the surge that we'd make sure that the majority Shia government in Baghdad, which is highly influenced by Iran, would treat them well, would do fine by them, would share wealth, would do all the things they need to do. Well, that didn't happen, and the Iranians took more control, and essentially, those guys got burned. Now, we're, we're going to ask them to do it again. Trust us again, really, and the central government will do fine by you, and don't worry about the Iranian influence, and don't worry about the Shia militias that just slaughtered their way across that territory to push ISIS out. And one thing that has not been covered much is just exactly how bad that was. All right, the humanitarian and sectarian slaughter during the reconquest there was outrageous. So we need help there. Well, there's two countries that have a border on southern Iraq who could help us, the Saudis and Jordan. All right, they've got a dog in this fight. And now that President Trump has a new best friend, Mohammed bin Sultan, okay, the new Saudi crown prince, who has said maybe it wasn't such a great idea to back all those Wahhabists who've been killing everybody, because at this point he's afraid they're going to shut down his monarchy, you know, and then he won't have his Lamborghini SUVs and all the other things he likes so much. So he's looking more realistically. If we can bring some of the Gulf Arabs in for rebuilding, 
they can foot the bill. And you know, President Trump like it, likes it when other people pay for things. So if we can get the Saudis and the other Gulf Arabs to kick in some reconstruction money to start commerce with the Sunni areas and potentially to provide some peacekeeping forces, I think we're in a position to provide a counterweight to Iran's move into those areas and to stop that land bridge from solidifying. So it's going to be a little tough. You know, I mean, it's not an easy thing. Uh, it's, you're going to have Sunni and Shia. And the, uh, last time I heard, the Kurds are having a referendum on independence. So it's, uh, it's messy. All right. Well, if it's easy, everybody would have taken care of it already. But right now, we need to look at what's the best way to stop either Iranian domination of those regions or a third Sunni insurgency. And neither one of those is a particularly good idea. So if we can get some help from the Gulf Arab states and push Iran out of those areas, we will actually have accomplished something. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Mark. Great. Well, share some thoughts. Uh, th thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you to Heritage. The, uh, it's great to be here because for me, Heritage in many respects is kind of the house of, of Reagan. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but Heritage had a huge influence on the Reagan administration, both in terms of ideas and policies and people who went into the Reagan administration. So um, the reason I, I mentioned President Reagan is I think when you deal with Iran, you've got to take a page from the, the Reagan playbook. And I think it's worth remembering that when Ronald Reagan came in office in 1980, uh, he also inherited a, a mess, a global uh, dog's breakfast, as it were. And, and Reagan had to shift U.S. policy from a policy of containment vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union to one of aggressive neutralization and, and rollback. And he, he identified the Soviet Union in many respects um, very similar to, to revolutionary Iran. It was an aggressive regime. It was a revolutionary regime. But it was an internally fragile regime. And the Reagan administration by 1983 had developed something called National Security Decision Directive 75. And that was a all-of-government approach using all instruments of American power to roll back and subvert so Soviet power globally. Right? And the elements were very important. There was a massive defense buildup. I know Heritage played a, a significant role in, in recommendations on how to build up and expand our military potency. Uh, there was an element of economic and energy warfare. And again, I know Heritage played, played a significant role in the ideas uh, about how to drain the resources of the Soviet state. There was support for anti-Soviet proxies and dissidents, and really reaching out around the world to those who were uh, under Soviet domination and figuring out ways to support them. There was a offensive against the ideological legitimacy right, of communism. And I think President Reagan was really brilliant in articulating the case against communism. But what NSDD 75 didn't do, it didn't have a myopic focus on arms control. Right? You didn't see in the first few years, certainly not until really 1986, uh, the Reagan administration obsessing over SOL II and obsessing over these deeply flawed arms control agreements that uh, Pre President Reagan's predecessors had signed. Right? So think of that as we think about Iran. So what do we need when it comes to Iran? I think we need to move away from the same myopic focus on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran deal that the Obama administration reached. And we need to move to a Iran policy, an Iran NSDD 75, where the Trump administration uses all the instruments of American power, again, to neutralize and roll back Iranian regional influence and Iranian global influence, and hit at some of the same areas that, that President Reagan hit at. The, the problem with where we are today on Iran is that the JCPOA itself has not only taken all of our, our energy and resources in this town, um, but it's also created policy paralysis. And that policy paralysis was very much exploited by Iran over the past eight years, I think as both Jim and Jim have very well articulated. We were so afraid of the Iranian uh, shadow. We were so afraid the Iranians wouldn't reach a nuclear deal, and then we were so afraid the Iranians would walk away from that nuclear deal that we were unwilling to actually counter Iranian aggression. And so I would argue that the administration has to move away from this myopic focus on the JCPOA. And let's move to countering the Iranian lethal end state, which is where the regime is heading. Well, what is the lethal end state? The lethal end state is, in about 10 years' time, Iran will have, thanks to this deal, an industrial-sized nuclear program. All they have to do is wait until the key restrictions on the program sunset, 
and they will emerge with a legal, internationally recognized, NPT-compliant, industrial-sized nuclear program. That program will be powered by advanced centrifuges. It will have near-zero nuclear breakout. It will have an easier clandestine sneak-out option. It will have ICBMs. It will have an economy which, if it grows at 5 6% a year, will be about a tr trillion dollars within a decade. So it will increasingly be immunized against our ability to use sanctions and other forms of economic pressure, particularly as the Europeans make significant investments in Iran and are, are afraid to lose those investments and resist our ability to impose sanctions and, and snap back sanctions. And Iran will have, as Jim and Jim have articulated, increasing regional hegemony in countries like Lebanon and Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, and they're pushing at Saudi, the Saudi Arabia eastern provinces where there's a uh, majority Shiite population, they're pushing at Bahrain, and they're working globally. I mean, they're working in our backyard in Latin America, as, as many people at Heritage and in FDD and elsewhere have analyzed that their influence in Latin America is growing. So you'll have a lethal Iranian end state in a decade, and anybody who tells you that in a decade, not to worry, we'll have all instruments of American power available to us today is misleading you, because Iran will be stronger, it'll be richer, it'll be more dangerous, and they'll be at a near-zero nuclear breakout. And the last time I checked, you, you don't sanction a country and stop them from actually developing nuclear weapons where they're a turn of the screw away from having nuclear weapons. So we will have an option. It'll be a military option. And so it's not the JCPOA or war, it's the JCPOA and war. And when that war comes, the consequences will be much more devastating. All right, so what do we do? We've talked about the rollback strategy regionally, and Jim and Jim have done a, a very good job of explaining that. It's an incredibly difficult problem. I'm, I'm very worried about Syria. I don't have any good answers. Um, but I think uh, the Trump administration inherited a mess, and I'm not sure that I quite see the way forward on these deals with the Russians as the Iranians continue to push forward and forward in establishing this, this land bridge. I'm um, more enthusiastic and more um, positive about the, the job Mike Pompeo is doing at CIA. I think that the agency has been put on a war footing against Iranian networks and Iranian influence operations. And I, I see a emboldened CIA with the necessary resources and the political backing to really go uh, move aggressively against these networks. So a regional approach an approach targeting networks. Um, certainly we've talked a lot about the money issue here, and clearly you are not going to be able to do anything about the Iranian threat unless you drain them of their resources. And the JCPOA, is, as Jim said, has given them not only $100 billion in cash, but has opened up oil markets, opened up the global financial system, opened up opportunities on, on industrial trade. And the Iranian economy, which was in 2013, at negative 6.5% GDP, 40, 50% of official inflation rates, had about four to six months away before it was reaching a balance of payments crisis because it had about no more than $20 billion in foreign exchange resor resources. It was on the verge of collapse before President Obama decided to do the interim deal and then the final deal. Well, that economy today is growing at four, five, six percent The Iranians have access to another $100 billion to shore up their foreign exchange reserves. Inflation has gone down to single digits. It's an economy that is on the mend. And as that economy grows, as I said, it becomes much more difficult for us to use economic pressure. So this is the time to put on the pressure. This is the time to follow the recent congressional sanctions mandating the IRGC be designated as a terrorist organization in its entirety. This is the time to go full throttle on IRGC designations. There maybe are 80 or so designations that have ever been done against the IRGC in all these years, uh, and yet there are thousands and thousands of IRGC targets, including in open source databases that uh, if you do a lot of digging, you'll find many, many of these targets that meet the designation threshold for Treasury. So certainly, this was a good time to, to do this designation and go after the thousands of IRGC companies that dominate the strategic sectors of Iran's economy. And on the democracy side, this is a time to strengthen the democracy forces in Iran, uh, those forces that were, were crushed in 2009, but still exist. 
and the gap between the rulers and the ruled is only growing in Iran. This whole notion that President Rouhani leads a stable uh, political government and, and country where he has all this tremendous support, the reality is the brutal repression of the Iranian people, the human rights abuses, the massive corruption is only increasing the gap between the rulers and the ruled. So let's, let's try to the extent we can to intensify that. So now we get to uh, the nuclear deal and what the Trump administration should do. Well, first and foremost, as I've made clear, the fundamental weakness of this deal, the fatal flaw of the sunset provisions, the notion that somehow, regardless of Iranian behavior, the restrictions go away over time is unacceptable and should be unacceptable as a statement of US policy. The Trump administration should come out soon with a clear statement that of US policy that the sunset provisions will not be honored by the United States. We shall not allow Iran to take patient pathways to nuclear weapons and ICBMs. Second, we were told by the Obama administration over and over again that we would get access to all sites, including military sites. You remember that? Well, if you were listening to the Iranians way back in 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, they have said repeatedly over and over again from Ali Khamenei all the way down that you will never ever get into our military sites. We repeat, you will never, ever, ever, ever get into our military sites. You are delusional. I think as a, a recent uh, Iranian official said, maybe yesterday, you are, you're, you're dreaming if you think you're ever going to get into our military sites. Well, there is no way to verify this nuclear deal if we can't get into their military sites. Because guess where they're going to actually conduct illicit activity? Guess where they're going to design warheads? Guess where they're going to... Uh, manufacture advanced centrifuges that exceed the limits permitted under the JCPOA. Right? Guess where they're going to do that? They're going to do that in sites where they deny us access. And every site where they deny us access will be deemed a military site. So if we can't get into military sites, this deal is useless. So we have to, as a matter of US policy, make it very clear that without physical IAEA access to military sites, there is no deal. And that has to be made very clear by this administration. The third issue is long-range ballistic missiles capable of carrying warheads. Um, the Obama administration initially demanded that. The Iranians said no. And the Obama administration took it off the table. So in the JCPOA itself, there, the, the ballistic missile issue is not addressed. But it is addressed in the UN Security Council Resolution 2231, which is the UNSCR that implements the nuclear agreement. So we need to use that as a predicate to insist as a matter of US policy that Iran shall not be allowed to develop long-range ballistic missiles capable of carrying a warhead. Because that program will produce ICBMs, as we've seen in North Korea. And there is no point in controlling Iranian enrichment or plutonium reprocessing if you're going to allow Iran to have those restrictions lifted over time while giving it a free pathway to develop ICBMs. It, it makes no sense. As a statement of US policy, we should be, have an absolute prohibition against the development of these missiles. And finally, this whole notion of what Iran has done in the past with respect to the possible military dimensions of its program, the, the possible <laughs> military dimensions of its program, <laughs> right, the military dimensions of its program, they were completely swept under the carpet by the Obama administration who said, don't worry about the past. Let's, let's only be concerned about the future. So what Iran has done in the past should be of no consequence. And we know there's about 11 and a half outstanding questions from the IAEA report of 2011 about what Iran did in these sites with respect to nuclear weaponization. But let's not concern ourselves with that. Let's just close the file and move ahead. Well, we can't close the file. In fact, from what I understand, the IAEA hasn't actually technically closed that file. We need to reopen the PMD file, and we need to get into those sites, and we need to interview those scientists, and we need to see the documentation, because there is no way we can have a, an adequate baseline about Iran's nuclear program if we're completely blind. And not only are we completely blind, or some may say we're not blind, the intelligence community knows exactly what's going on, let's assume for the sake of argument they do. They probably don't know exactly what's going on, but let's assume they do. W Iran has succeeded in making the case that they are innocent. Right? They've never admitted their guilt. They are, from a nuclear perspective, innocent. And that narrative right, has been accepted by the United States and the international community. So you have to get Iran to 
permit inspectors into these sites, scientists to be interrogated, because we need to make the international case, and Iran has to be brought to the table to admit that they were engaged in weaponization efforts. Otherwise, their claims of nuclear innocence continue, and every presidential certification every 90 days only reinforces these claims of nuclear innocence. So it took Ronald Reagan six years after NSDD 75 was introduced in 1983 for the Soviet Union to collapse. Um, we have uh, a, a huge project ahead of us, but what Reagan did to the mullahs, Donald Trump has to do, uh, I should say what Reagan did to the communists, Donald Trump has to do to the mullahs. And the lethal end state is only, only a decade away. Thank you, Mark. Um, using the uh, moderator's prerogative, um, what are your thoughts on uh, North Korea-Iran cooperation on ballistic missiles and uh, nuclear matters? Uh, that obviously complicates it well beyond uh, the access of International Atomic Energy Agent inspectors to any sort of sites in, in Iran. you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, Peter, as you, as you know, and as, as certainly folks at Heritage have, have outlined in a lot of detail and, and other places, uh, there's been a long-standing relationship between Iran and North Korea with respect to ballistic missile cooperation. Um, that relationship continues. It, it certainly wouldn't be a surprise if a North Korean ICBM uh, was renamed in Farsi, and the, the Iranians found themselves with an uh, with a, a instant ICBM program. So the cooperation on ballistic missiles, I think, is, is long-standing and is deeply problematic. And again, let's just keep reminding ourselves what you need for a deliverable nuclear weapon, right? You need fissile material, you need a warhead, and you need a missile. And so the JCPOA temporarily deals with the fissile material, right, creates a a huge hole with respect to warhead design because we can't get into their military sites and doesn't even address missiles, mm -hmm. uh, never mind Iranian-North Korean cooperation with respect to missile development. The other aspect of the relationship that really intrigues me, and I think there's tantalizing hints of cooperation, but obviously this is something that hasn't been yet nailed down, is to what extent Iran and North Korea are cooperating on the nuclear side. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? And there I think the the... Um, the IC needs to be directed. It's a very difficult intelligence challenge, but to really fig to, to follow some of these leads, you know, was Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, the head of Iran's military nuclear program, at a North Korean nuclear test? Mm -hmm. If so, why? Right? Are there um, the 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 fact that the uh, the Israelis bombed a North Korean nuclear reactor in Al Khaibar uh, in Syria? Who mm -hmm. who financed that? But mm -hmm. certainly, was it financed by the North Koreans? Was it financed by the Syrians? Or, or was there a third-party financier? Maybe it was the Iranians. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other tantalizing hints of this nuclear cooperation, which sounds only logical, but needs to certainly be backed up with, with, with evidence? Because it may be that all of this focus on Iran and its nuclear program on Iranian soil is a head fake. Because what's really happening is the cooperation between Iran and North Korea on North Korean soil is where some of the more dangerous uh, research and development is taking place. Anyone else on that issue? Yeah, I would just add that uh, yeah, there's no way that Syria had the economic wherewithal to finance uh, that kind of uh, project. And it's clear to me, although it hasn't been confirmed as far as I know by intelligence uh, assets, that the Iranians were behind that. Uh, and if they're behind extraterritorial nuclear cooperation with Korea, why not in, in North Korea? I mean, we do know that Iranian scientists have been observers at uh, the ballistic missile launchers and I think some of the nuclear tests as well. Uh, so, you know, I think that's a tremendous area for investigation. Okay. Let's move the question and answer. Uh, raise your hand. I'll, I'll call on you and we'll bring you a microphone if you would... Identify yourself, especially if you're a member of the media, for our panelists, and let us know who the question is directed to. I would, uh, I would appreciate it. So, are there any questions? We solved all the problems. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Hi, uh, David Isby. Uh, for Jim Phillips. Oh. Thank you. For Jim Phillips. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting changes in their regional behavior has been the apparent shift in Afghanistan where not only have they been recruiting Afghans and taking up a 
into the vacuum in some of the sh Shia areas, especially the Hazarajat, but now they seem to be applying the Russian relationship uh, from Syria to Afghanistan. How do you see this change uh, in Iranian policy? I think there's, there's an Iranian saying about spreading your feet to the limits of your carpet. And I think the Iranians, uh, especially under the Obama administration, perceived the U.S. to be on its way out the door, not only in the Middle East, but in Af Afghanistan. Uh, and they've been uh, improving uh, their relationships with the Taliban, which is, as you know, David, has been historically uh, fraught with hostility and tension. Uh, the Taliban uh, murdered, uh, uh, I think it was 11 Iranian Revolutionary Guards in, in northern Afghanistan, uh, uh, I think it was 1998, and they, the two countries almost went to war, but now uh, we see Iran uh, actually stepping up shipments to the Taliban in addition to its uh, historic ties to the Hazarajat, as you mentioned, uh, and I think that can be explained with another Iranian saying, which is, uh, you use the hand of your enemy to catch a snake. Yeah. What about, um, you guys painted a pretty gloomy picture here, Iran on the roll, and I think you've done a good job of that. What, what challenges uh, is Iran facing? And what are they worried about? Is there potential overstretch because of their involvement in, in Syria uh, and Iraq and, and Yemen? I mean, what, what is, uh, what are, is there any good news in terms of uh, slowing their, uh, what you're portraying, advance? I think they have to be looking at the growing Gulf Cooperation Council U.S. partnership as a major counterweight, and good. You know, it's needed. And I think that's, uh, that's one of the things President Trump did that really, he's, he's got a habit of deciding to kick over conference tables. You know, when he walks into a situation, he's like, okay, let's these preconceived notions be gone. What if the Saudis and us actually partner in a real way? What if the Saudis aren't lying when they say they actually want to stop funding terrorism? And so he kind of cut them loose on Qatar. You know, he kind of used them as a stalking horse for the idea that you can't do this and we're going to actually work with the guys who will work with us. Now, the enemy of all of those guys is Iran. So if you look at the fact that he's now proven that he can at least in some way work productively with the Saudis and UAE and some of the other Gulf states, then those guys become Iran's problem in a big way because Qatar and Iran have been tap dancing a little bit, you know, and there's, there's also you know, Turkey's over there doing some things we're not too, uh, not too thrilled about. So I think the idea of at least engaging in a way where we weren't just accepting the Saudis as number 1A largest state sponsor of terror and pushing them on that in return for their efforts against what is a larger threat, I think that's something Iran has to worry about. Well, I would say certainly on the economic side, I mean, I, I painted a bleak picture from our perspective of an Iran economy that is, that is slowly recovering from, from the, 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 the nadir of 2013. But the reality is, is that economy is, is slowly recovering. It's fragile. Um, a lot of international banks are unwilling to do business with Iran. A lot of international companies are, are fearful of going back into Iran because we still command a huge economic um, in influence and, and, and leverage tool set. I mean, we, if we use the power of our secondary sanctions, we make it very clear to international companies that we have a $19 trillion market. The Iranians have a $450 billion market. You choose. You choose. And I, the reality is everybody in this town talks about the importance of keeping the Europeans on board and, and we don't want to lose the Europeans. And I think that's true. But I, I think when it comes down to it, the Europeans are not going to abandon the U.S. market for Iran. I mean, there will be screaming and there will be crying and there will be a lot of concern expressed. But at the end of the day, if the Europeans believe that we're going to use our secondary sanctions hammer, um, they, will choose the, they will choose U.S. market access. They will choose U.S. dollar access. And, and I just conclude with this. I think the most important thing that Donald Trump can do through all of this is maintain the credibility of the walkaway option. Right? Not only the credibility of US military force, which I think is now being restored after eight years of being significantly degraded, but the walkaway option. Donald Trump has to make it clear, 
I hate this deal. This is a bad deal for U.S. national security. And I am prepared to walk away unless I get certain concessions. Uh, and those concessions are going to have to come from, uh, from the Europeans as well. And they, they, have to be, they have to be put on notice that unless they begin to work with us to address the sunset provisions and some of the other fatal flaws of the nuclear deal, um, that Donald Trump may one day just turn over the conference table and walk away from the deal. Yeah, I think uh, one long-term problem that the Iranian regime has is a, a tension between the national interests of the Iranian state and the ideological revolutionary interests of uh, the Iranian revolution. And the supreme leader, uh, I think many people lose sight of this, is focused on protecting and exporting Iran's revolution. And the Iranian people have paid a heavy price for that in terms of sanctions, uh, uh, in terms of uh, a long bloody war with Iraq that was provoked by Iranian uh, attempts to subvert uh, Iraqi Shia. Uh, and I think in, this tension is, is growing and it's, some, it's a point of, of leverage uh, that the U.S. and others could use to say, you know, we have nothing against the Iranian people. Uh, we have many uh, parallel interests in uh, allowing the free flow of Iranian oil, uh, if it's a friendly regime, out of the Persian Gulf. Uh, uh, but it's the actions of this regime in its supporting and exporting uh, terrorism and revolution that really hurt the long-term interests of the Iranian people. And I think back in 2009, you, we saw the Green Movement uh, uh, take that uh, somewhat to heart. And I think I Iranians are, are resent the fact that the regime is spending billions of dollars in Syria and rebuilding Lebanon when uh, Iranians at home uh, are really uh, not in the best economic place. You know, I think that's on that point. I think it's worth noting that the Iranian people and the regime are different. You know, and it might be a good time for the president to remind those people that maybe it'd be more fun to deal with a resurgent Persia type state as opposed to the Islamic Republic of Iran and say the United States would not be displeased. You know, if that were to happen, we don't have to deal with a doomsday cult of 12th Imam Nuttas as the, the people running that country, all right? They, they almost got it, as Jim mentioned. That was close in 2009. Obama threw him under the bus. Mm -hmm. President Trump could point out that if that happened again, we wouldn't be mad about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would add to that, you know, one of the brilliant things Reagan did in, in implementing the strategy I talked about was he used the bully pulpit in, in, in a very effective way to communicate to people who lived inside the Iron Curtain that America stood with them. I, I, you know, I'm critical of the administration so far on that. I, I really think that they've missed the huge opportunity. The last Nauru's speech or statement that was put out, huge opportunity missed to, to do exactly what Jim has said and just remind the Iranian people how brutally repressive their leaders are, that we stand with the people, right? and, and do what Reagan did. Um, again, the, you know, the travel ban, I mean, there's, there's some good elements to the travel ban. I think one of the unfortunate elements is in... Um, not sending a message that, you know, we want Iranians to come to this country. Uh, we want them to live here. We want them to visit here. You know, we, we're happy to facilitate a brain drain. I mean, obviously, well vetted. You know, you know, people come to this country. I'm an immigrant to this country. It took me, you know, 13, 14 years to become a U.S. citizen. It's, it's a tough process. It should be a tough process. It's the greatest country on earth. It shouldn't be easy to become a U.S. citizen. But there should be a pathway to becoming a U.S. citizen, a, a patient pathway. Um, to being a citizen, and I, I worry that somehow we're closing that off to, to the Iranian people. So that's where the president, I think, really needs to step up. And the next Nauru speech, uh, I hope, will be a lot more clear in, in supporting the people than the last one. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Why don't we take these two questions, and then we'll uh, allow the, uh, the panel to, uh, allow the panel to uh, uh, go ahead and answer them. Boris Zorman with FTD. There was recent photo evidence of Iran Air continuing to uh, ship Iranian soldiers to Syria. Should Iran Air be redesignated? Okay. And is that some kind of material breach of something? I don't know. I'm just curious. Well, let's, let's take this other question since <laughs> yeah. we're kind of running out of time, and then you guys can 
chat up. Uh, Brandon Wheeler from the Freedom Research Foundation. Um, the, the question I have is with regards to minorities within uh, Iran. So Iran, the remnants of the Persian Empire, you have the Baluch, the Ahwazi, the Azeri, and the Kurdi. And uh, the last census they had was 50%, more than 50% of the country was actually minorities. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, the remnants of this, this empire. Uh, similar to your Reagan uh, analogy, it seems there should be a concerted effort to appealing to these, whether it's, you know, voice um, or actually running uh, real projects on the ground to support them, some of which have been fighting ISIS inside of uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, where I just was. So I'd like to get your opinion on that and, um, and and what you think could be done. Okay. So, panel, I'll leave it open to you. All right. Let me just go Mark, down, down the for, list. Uh, okay, yeah. So on the first question, uh, yes, Iran Air should be redesignated. Iran Air has been shipping thousands of fighters and hundreds of thousands of kilograms of weaponry to mm -hmm. Bashar Assad. Iran Air uh, has multi-billion dollar deals with Boeing and Airbus and other airline companies. It should be redesignated. It is a breach of the JCPOA. The JCPOA, it's a breach by Iran of the JCPOA because the JCPOA requires a licensing regime to be set up so that the planes are used for peaceful purposes only. Mm. You know, sending Shiite fighters and, and missiles to Assad is not for peaceful purposes only. And real quickly to answer your question, I would put it this way. R Iran does not respect the territorial integrity of its neighbors, both near and far. Why should we? I'm 100% there. Security Studies Group put out a paper stating that most of the boundaries in that region are you know, post-colonial, global imperialist breakup, and they're arbitrary and stupid, and they don't reflect the wishes of the people. So if you've got boundaries that are causing issues and forcing people who hate each other to share a government, why? So I, I realize that kicks over about as many conference tables, apple carts, and rice bowls as you can. But so what? It's been going so well beforehand. It's worth considering, and it would put pressure on all the major powers to look at that as the potential next step. Jim? Yeah, I would just agree with the... the what was previously said by the panelists, especially uh, on Iran air, uh, it, this was very predictable that this was happening. And if they're doing this on something that is so visible, you wonder what they're doing in stretching uh, uh, the boundaries of permiss permiss permissible activity on the nuclear issue. And in the long run, you know, I think that's another uh, uh, a comparison you can make between uh, Iran and uh, the, the Soviet Empire is that towards the end the Russians were less than 50% of the, of the population and when the, the economic situation imploded uh, those uh, different nationalities uh, naturally sought uh, self-determination and freedom and Iran is no different. Uh, you know, their revolution has, has, the Iranian revolution has ended up oppressing many of these minorities, uh, religious and ethnic. Uh, and that, I think, in the long run is a weakness of the regime. Okay. I think we'll conclude there. Please join me in uh, thanking the panel for a rich and uh, thoughtful discussion today. Thank you.